It's an act of blind faith, isn't it? So you open a tap, you fill the glass, and then you take a sip. I didn't because I've just been told what might be in it. It's estimated a staggering 37% of South Africa's apparently clean, drinkable water is being lost through leaking pipes, dripping taps, and what's only that's only what's being reported. For years now, Dr. Anthony Turton, who's a water expert, he's a professor at the University of the Free State Centre for Environmental Management, has been working on the concept of water as an emerging business risk. This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield, and tonight we look at ways that South African business can help avert an impending water problem, which ultimately Ultimately, will affect bottom lines absolutely everywhere. Is water a business risk? Absolutely. Uh, if you can measure it, you can manage it. And if you don't know about it and you can't measure it, then it comes up and sneaks up and gives you a surprise. Now, I remember a, a copy of Fin Week magazine from about six years ago, probably, with the words Haka Hiaka, the letters Haka, which in English, uh, HKGK, means here comes big trouble. Um, and it's all about the coming water crisis. That was all about asset mine drainage and it was about wastage of clean water. Those are fundamental issues in our, in our water supply system. Yeah, we, uh, the question of is it a crisis, uh, are we in a crisis? Well, the crisis is a word that has got certain values and certain meanings to it. I believe it's a slow onset disaster. So the slow onset disaster differs from a crisis in the sense that we know what the outcome is going to be if we do nothing. So if we intervene in the meantime, we've got time to intervene, we can make a difference. But we've known for the last six, seven, eight, maybe even ten years that we've got a slow onset disaster coming. How much action has been taken in the decade that we've known that we've got a slow onset disaster looming? We've known since the 1970s. There was okay. a commission of inquiry into water matters oh, that, really? uh, absolutely, yeah. that, uh, that predicted uh, in, in the early part of the 21st century the following is going to happen unless we do things about it. So we've known about it for a long time. These things Things tend to get fairly politicised and they tend to get uh, uh, become boring and mundane and most people just take them for granted and that's the issue, you see. So because we've, ta we've taken them for granted for so long, we've forgotten about what has to be done about it. So what I've been trying to do is just really raise this issue as a boardroom level issue. Uh, if, if you can understand it, you can manage it. Uh, business is about managing risk. Once you can quantify the risk and deal with the risk, it's actually no longer a problem. In fact, it can very often become an opportunity. Okay, so give me a sense of what's happening in Joburg, for example. It's where most business is situated. Uh, we've got the Vaal Dam. We've got the Lesotho Highlands Water Scheme. We've got runoff that goes into the Vaal River that goes into the dam. Or does the dam go into the river? I forget. Okay. Ultimately, there's runoff. There are broken sewerage systems. There's acid mine drainage. There's a whole bunch of issues that affect the quality of what ends up in the glass. Absolutely. So it's, it's, a long, it's a long value chain. And in every one of those uh, links of the chain, something can go wrong. Or more importantly, an exchange of information needs to take place at that point. The chain is broken down. You know that if you've got a long, complex chain, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So let's understand where we are in Johannesburg. Johannesburg is the biggest city in the world that is not on a river, a lake, or a waterfront. Right. So we're a very sophisticated, complex uh, economy here that's based 100% on pumping water uphill and flushing it down the other side out of our toilets. I mean, it's, a fun, it's a, actually a, a, a remarkable achievement. Absolutely. That, okay. that we even get water to Joburg in the first place. Right. Now, the water we get is generally very good quality. So, for example, water coming from the Suda Highlands, you can bottle it and make money out of it and, you know, and sell it at that high value. Water coming out of the Tugela River Basin is pumped up the Draken Mountain, guess what? Using surplus energy from Eskom. Okay, <laughs> well, so that's the idea being that when they need the surge, the spike, uh, they can let it flow down the other, uh, other side and they can recover two thirds of the energy that they put into it. It's like a big battery yeah. that they charge on top of the mountain. Uh, well, that's now under, un, 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 under pressure. But more importantly, this all reports into the Val Dam. And we now know that the Val Dam is increasingly contaminated with uh, microcystin toxin, blue green algae, as a result of dysfunctional sewage works. It's then uh, abstracted by randwater, uh, treated at bulk level, uh, pumped uh, through a network of pipes, large diameter pipes, some of which are 100 years old, pipes that go almost from here to Cape Town and back, and then it gets distributed into this massive network at local municipal level, thousands, tens of thousands of kilometers of pipes, old, new, patched, you know, spaghettis of pipes, and then ultimately it ends up either in the factory or the house, where you do something with it, add value to it, it ends up as effluent, and you flush it down your toilet to put it down the drain, when it then gets transferred into the Limpopo River Basin on the other side of the mountain, uh, and it ends up in Hottebeersport Dam. 
Uh, so basically, this is how we recycle water in South Africa, and we've reached the limit of what we can do with that technology. Okay, so our technology is what? Is it 70s technology, 80s technology? A lot of it is, is 60s, 70s technology. And, and, and an interesting thing that happened in sort of 60s and 70s was the, uh, was the sexual revolution. Uh, birth control medication came out. So subsequent to the 60s and 70s, uh, estrogen has entered widestream uh, use in society. Estrogen passes through the body, partly metabolized. Guess what? We don't have the treatment technology to remove it from our, uh, our sewage stream. So let's look at the sewage problem in South Africa. We produce, we process... I'm not about, thirsty anymore, by okay, the way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We <laughs> process about 5,000, 5,200 mm -hmm. megalitres of, of sewage every day. Of that, about 4,200 is returned to a river in a partly treated state. Mm -hmm. so, and that ends up in, in some bulk water treatment system where it is then processed into, into potable water. So we've got a, a, a significant problem with our sewage. And if you compare the sewage flows, 4,200 megalitres, to the acid mine drainage flow, 18 megalitres. Yeah. The sewage return flows are about 230 times bigger yeah. than, than, your, than your acid mine drainage flow. So that gives you a kind of order of magnitude. So what do we do? I mean, we, we've got, we don't, we, there's a problem, fine. Yeah. There is a system that functions and works, but is under severe strain. Yeah. Do we, what, build a Mudupi equivalent for, for water treatment? No, I think we have to just raise awareness. And I think the important thing is, uh, I would like to put out uh, a, a very strong message today. Um, the current Minister of Water Affairs is the first minister subsequent to Carter Asmal that has initiated internal uh, um, uh, policy reform pro program, uh, evidence-based policy reform. So, in other words, instead of just shooting from the hip, yeah. there's now an internal process. So, I would like us to support the minister in that regard. Okay, Let's good. engage, particularly business, yeah. because part of what we're trying to do as well is in the mining sector. We've reached the end of some of the, certainly the gold mining uh, operations are very mature. Uh, some might uh, not last the next five years. So, we need to uh, um, engage in a new business model, because like it or not, Johannesburg is a city of gold. It's a city with, with six thousand, uh, sorry, six, 600, 600 kilotons of uranium tied up in the dumps around Johannesburg. If, if those companies go bankrupt in the next five years, yes. that liability is nationalized. What are we going to do about it? Extraordinary pressures coming through. A lot of people talk about the concept of water shedding. We've become used to load shedding. People say, oh, the next crisis is water. We're going to be, have water shedding. Technically, water shedding is actually, as I understand it, a pretty difficult thing to do. We could have a breakdown in the system, but the idea of managing water flow like we manage electricity is actually something of a, can I call it a pipe dream? Because it yes, is. I, I think it's impossible. Because if you look, if you look at, at, at load shedding, load shedding has, says, right, on the one side, we've got the supply of energy. Yeah. Other side, there's the demand of energy. So basically, the uh, demand exceeds supply so we have to do something. So the country is broken down into blocks and we shed blocks yeah. and we flip a switch, electrons stop flowing in copper cables and instantly we balance the demand. Now water is different because water is a localised thing, complex system, pipes, two metre diameter pipes in some places, takes a week to, to, to fill the pipes to get the air out of the pipes. So if you if you switched off an air, if you switched off Santon, for example, yeah. for two hours to yeah. ensure that Randburg got water, yeah. The pipes would drain, yes. and you wouldn't be able to fill those pipes for a week. It could take 10, yeah. day, ten days to reflood. In fact, we saw that when there was a Randwater pump uh, station yes. breakdown, where uh, parts of Johannesburg for almost 10 days did not have water. So that's one of the reasons why we can't have water shedding. But that's also one of the reasons why companies need to understand that these breakdowns, when they happen, they are catastrophic. Uh, that's on the quantity side. On the quality side, that's invisible. You don't see it. That's another issue that needs to be dealt sure. with. But ultimately, uh, uh, there are consequences for this. So, so we need to uh, think about having a generator on site. That's almost standard practice today. Then we also need to start thinking about having an alternative water supply or water treatment process. Okay, now, what, what are the alternatives? Because here we go, we, we can put, you can get a generator. That's easy enough. Yeah. As long as you've got diesel, yeah. you get enough power to function. Water storage. I mean, if you look at how much an average garden, for example, a northern suburbs garden takes, it can easily take 5,000 litres a day uh, of borehole water to sustain an ecosystem of a, a one hectare garden or one acre garden or whatever the case might be. For an office complex or for a factory, what kind of water supply solutions do you need to have? to keep, I don't know, a steel plant going for argument's sake. Well, you see, this, is a, this is a big question. We don't know. I mean, how long is a piece of string? It depends on what your operation's yeah. about. So, so boards need to understand that they've got to look at, look at the operation. Your smart companies, your big beer producers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, your big energy companies, they understand it. So Sassel, for example, has got a, a really good in-house in ability. SA Breweries, world-class. Uh, they understand uh, Nestle. These sort of people, they understand what's going on with water. It's the sort of medium-sized enterprise or the companies that aren't directly 
directly involved uh, in, in water processing. They are the ones that are vulnerable. A, a really stupid question, but can't we just sort of go to the root cause, go to the, the source of the problem, which is at water treatment plants? and fix that? Well, I think we need to do that, because, uh, but we need to prioritize that because at the moment that's very low down on, on the list of priorities. Uh, we, our we national have, priorities. Our national yeah. priorities. We, we're not investing the correct money in that type of thing. And even if we made a decision tomorrow to invest in the appropriate technologies, it will take a decade for those investments to start rolling out. So that, that comes down to the sort of immediate short-term problem. And that immediate short-term problem is an end-of-pipe solution. So what your, whatever your factory is, your business, you, you're at the end of a pipe and that you, you're at the start of a, of, of, of a sewage pipe. So at the end of your, of your clean water pipe, you've got to do something there. You either got to create your own sort of on-site storage or, or processing uh, of, of the water quality. And then on the sewage return flow side, the whole idea of recycling. And the bottom line is if we all recycle whatever water we use every day, 1.6 times by 2035, we're going to have full employment, happy, <laughs> smiling people, okay, and a growing economy. That's yeah. what we need to do. 1.6 yeah. and the target's by 2035. That's, that's the target. The, the point is, there's, there's enough of it. There's enough, there's enough water. We could make it work. Yeah. But it requires a very fundamental shift in the way which, which we think about it and the way we treat the resource. The funny thing about water is we treat it like a stock, but it's actually a flux. A stock is something that you start with 100% of, you draw it down, you, know, you take natural capital, convert it into financial capital and other capital, and you, and you throw away the discard. Water's not like that, it's a flux. In that, in that glass there, a dinosaur's kidney processed some of, the, <laughs> some of that water 60 you know, <laughs> million years ago. Okay? So in other words, because we can re recycle it, it doesn't make sense to flush your toilet with drinking water. So we're moving to a future economy where we're going to have what I call a dual stream reticulation system where water of different quality at different prices is used for different purposes. And where you can internally recycle, that's what's going to happen. But now if you look, for example, at Sant and look at you know, where we are now, the building codes don't allow for recycling. So we don't have sort of separation, for example, sewage separation at source. Uh, you know, solid and liquid get separated. If you go to Sweden, for example, they've got these you know, separation at source. So you've got solid waste and liquid waste already. It's, you know, it's a very sophisticated it's process. It's a fundamental difference. Uh, we, we have to leave it there. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much. And um, cheers to you. What, what's, what's in there that I can't see? I mean, it looks absolutely perfect. It, it well, smells fine. It's slightly chlorine but we're used to that. This is Randwater water and it's pretty good stuff. You know, it's, uh, what might uh, be in there? Well, uh, well, potentially, I don't want to scare you, but, uh, but, but what we are, have to be increasingly worried about is microsystem. Our microsystem levels in the country are out of control, and we, we, people need to understand what microsystem is. So please go and Google the word okay, microsystem. Micro, micro. But if there's estrogen in there. Yeah, 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 and you're endocrine disruptors, because we are moving to a recycling economy, and, we, and, and it's fine you can recycle when you go, go to the moon in the space shuttle, they recycle, yeah. but they've got technology to remove all the bad stuff. Bottled water only for Springboks, please. <laughs> Dr. Anthony Turton, water expert, professor at the University of the Free State Centre for Environmental Management. Thank you for watching. There'll be more good advice tomorrow. Brush your teeth before you go to bed. Good night.